We're live. Thank you. Will sergeants please start their recordings at this time? PC recording has started. Our recording started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Transportation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification. Once again, we ask for all panelists to please turn on their video for verification. To minimize disruption, we ask that everyone please place electronic devices on silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council dot myc dot gov again that is testimony at council dot myc dot gov thank you for your cooperation chair rodriguez we are ready to begin thank you sergeants uh, thank you all for joining our uh, for joining our virtual hearing today on accessibility of the streets first i'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedure items. Uh, uh, thank you, Eddie. Thank you. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee at the New York City Council. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. The first panelist will be from the Department of Transportation, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalks and Inspection Management, Leon Hayward, Assistant Commissioner for Street Improvement Programs, Sean Quinn, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zach. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair or I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Um, before I turn the hearing back over to the chair, I would like to acknowledge that we have been joined by council members Diaz, Holden, Ku, and Rose. Uh, chair Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to hope that everyone have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I know that this is this holiday was completely different from the previous one, but I know as New Yorkers, we did what we had to do to celebrate Thanksgiving, uh, keeping the distance and limiting the numbers of family members that we got together with. So hopefully everyone were able to contribute uh, to deal with this epidemic that still uh, can bring a second wave uh, to our city. And we as New Yorkers has to be ready to work together and fight against this epidemic and come out stronger than before. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Committee on Transportation convenes remotely to hold a hearing on the following oversight topic, accessibility of the streets. As we know, in the past month, our life has dramatically changed. The pandemic has changed the way in which we interact in, in our streets. Notably, the city is reimagining re public space and how the public interact with th this space, including innovative and creative ways to expand and use sidewalk and outside space has been increasingly seen. As these space are being reconstructed and utilized in different manner, it is important to remember to ensure that the accessibility of these streets street is maintained for all New Yorkers and visitors, particularly for those New Yorkers or visitors that are living with physical challenges. In New York City, there are more than 920,000 New Yorkers who self-identify as individuals with disability or individuals with physical challenges. And it is estimated that there are about 6 million annual visitors to the city who also uh, have deal with physical challenges. To ensure that these individuals living with physical challenges have the same rights and ability to live as those without uh, disabilities, the Mayor's Office for People with Disability was established in 1973. The office makes sure 
that all city initiatives, programs, and policies are adequately addressing the need of those individuals who contribute the same as those that they don't have to deal with physical challenges. Today, we are here and, and ready to listen from DOT. Its goal, which goal is to provide for safe, efficient, and environmentally responsible movement of people and good in New York City. Although DOT's main goal is to ensure safety, safety for all, DOT also implements programs to help make New York City a street more accessible. DOT has taken a specific measures to ensure that individuals with low visions, hearing, connective disabilities, or limited mobility are able to access our streets. All DOT's policies comply with applicable laws, of which include, but not limited to, the Americans Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. To ensure compliance and inclusion of all individuals with physical challenges, DOT has committed to making all streets accessible by implementing pedestrians ramps to get on and off streets and sidewalks ensure those who are blind or low vision are aware of the location of bike lanes throughout the city. Create a campaign called the Cycle Eyes Campaign, which looks to increase Chair. awareness of vulnerable- Chair Rodriguez, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we're having some technical issues in the background. So if we could just pause for one moment. Thank you. It is my background or anybody else? No, no, I, I think we're having some issues with the uh, live streaming of the hearing. Okay. So just give us a minute to figure that out in the background. Thank you. Okay, okay.
Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. We're just waiting on uh, the stream to be corrected. Just give us a couple of moments. Okay. Uh, Chair Rodriguez, I'm going to remute you. Um, as soon as we're ready to begin, I'll come back on the live.
Chair Rodriguez. Hello? You can begin where you left off. Okay. Give me one second, please. Give me one second. Take your time. Okay, ready. First one, sorry for the technical issues. And as I, I was saying, DOT has committed to making all the streets accessible by implementing pedestrian ramps to get end of streets and sidewalks, ensure those, uh, ensure those who are blind or low vision are aware of the location of bike lanes throughout the city create a campaign called the Cycle Eyes Campaign, which looks to increase awareness of vulnerable road users, especially low vision or blind pedestrians throughout the city. They've implemented accessibility measures within DOT's pedestrian plazas programs, which looks to create more public open space by utilizing underutilized street space and converting them into plazas where New Yorkers can sit, rest, socialize, and enjoy public life. The DOT ensure pedestrian signals have accessibility features to protect pedestrians who are blind or who have low vision by assisting them in crossing the street with short, uh, short recorder messages and sounds. Ensuring pedestrians in trouble are accessible to all pedestrians, providing visual signals for pedestrians to walk and cars to go, implementing safe streets for seniors, a major pedestrian safety initiative for all the New Yorkers, and implementing City Bench, a program that installs benches throughout the city that make streets more comfortable for transit riders and pedestrians, especially for those who are older and disabled. During today's hearing, I would also like to hear more on how the DOT is working with the MTA to ensure that all train stations are accessible. Again, this is something that is important for all New Yorkers and especially during this time where we hear the reality of the MTA dealing with financial crisis, it is important that we hear from DOT, how is the agency continue conversation with the MTA? It is my goal to ensure that all the stations become accessible by 2030. We cannot forget about the almost 1 million New Yorkers and more than 5 million visitors with physical challenges who also deserve our support. At today's hearing, we hope to hear testimony from the MOP, MOP and DOT regarding how they are expanding and improving accessibility related programs, initiatives and policies throughout the city. We want to look at how the city is managing its streets and ensuring that they are both meeting safety criteria and ensuring accessibility. Uh, I will now have our moderator and committee council call on the administration to testify and to administer the oath. Thank you. Um, before I do that, I would like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by council members Cohen, Levine, Deutsch, Minchaka, Cabrera, and Miller. Um, I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Uh, Leon Hayward, Sean Quinn, and Rebecca Zach. 
uh, I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each individual to confirm their response on the record. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Hayward? I do. Assistant Commissioner Quinn? I do. Assistant Commissioner Zach? I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when you're ready. And, and before, before they begin, I would like to express our thank you to the former commissioner. Uh, probably this is like a, the first hearing that we don't have a former commissioner of police under with all. And I know that the whole team that we see, who are here today, they will represent the agency well but we will always miss our great DOT commissioner. And as we express to her, we hope the best luck for her on whatever plans she has, she has for the future. She came with a spring at the national level. And I know that as we will be missing at the city level, I know, I hope that she will help us at some level if she will decide to go to DC. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Leon Hayward, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalk Inspection Management, or SIM, at the New York City Department of Transportation. And I am joined by Sean Quinn, Assistant Commissioner of Street Improvement Programs, and Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg on street accessibility. Under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, DOT and this administration are committed to creating a more accessible city for all New Yorkers. One of DOT's core focuses is maintaining and enhancing our pedestrian infrastructure free of defects and accessible to all. Last year, SIM performed over 22,500 inspections and reconstructed over 2.1 million square feet of defective sidewalk citywide. Now, turning to pedestrian ramps. Pedestrian ramps provide access on and off over 12,700 miles of sidewalks at approximately 185,000 street corners, mid-block crossings, and medians, and are essential for all pedestrians, people with disabilities, and older adults. Currently, DLT upgrades pedestrian ramps primarily by following the agency's resurfacing operation. In addition, Pedestrian ramps are addressed when responding to 301 complaints, sidewalk improvement programs, and sidewalk repairs. But recently, you may have seen more of our in-house crews and DDC managed contractors around as we take on the task of assessing and upgrading every pedestrian ramp throughout the city. DOT has added a team of hundreds of permanent and seasonal employees, including planners, engineers, in-house construction crews, and inspectors and in partnership with our sister agency, DDC, is awarding billions of dollars in contracts. In October of last year, DLT completed a citywide survey using innovative technology to collect data on pedestrian ramp elements. We contracted a technology company who surveyed a total of 217,678 ramps using high definition street level imagery and new software to extract each ramp's measurements. We also train other agencies, developers, and utility companies on ADA requirements for the pedestrian ramps included in their projects. Finally, we have a dedicated outreach team for community engagement and are collecting and tracking data through a comprehensive asset management system. This long-term undertaking presents tremendous challenges at great scale. We must design and construct around numerous right-of-way infrastructure, including utility lines, catch basins, hydrants, street lights, trees, elevated and below ground transit structures, vaults under the sidewalks, distinctive material in landmark historic districts, and narrow sidewalks, among others. And to make it even more challenging, the city streetscape is ever changing with private developers, utilities, and other agencies working on our streets and sidewalks every day. This administration believes in providing safe and accessible means of travel for all New Yorkers, 
and is proud to be dedicating very robust resources to that goal under the mayor's leadership. Since July 2017, we have installed 1,185 missing ramps and upgraded 21,000 existing ramps. The public can see the most recent survey data, assessment, and construction progress at www.nycpegramps.info. Now, Assistant Commissioner Quinn will discuss our work to create new pedestrian enha enhancements, our engagement with the disability community for project design, use of the curb, and finally, how evolving street use in the face of COVID-19 impacts accessibility. Thank you, Leon. Good afternoon. I am Sean Quinn, Assistant Commissioner for Street Improvement Programs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Pedestrian enhancements are a major focus for DOT and our Vision Zero efforts. Within the agency, the pedestrian unit works with other operational and planning units to implement new and expanded pedestrian facilities and to create new pedestrian connections. One recent example is at the complex intersection of Bronx Park East and Bronxdale Avenue, where we installed 12,500 square feet of sidewalk to create new pedestrian connections where there was only once a parking field. Another is at the historic intersection of York Street and Pearl Street in Brooklyn, where we installed new crossings with smooth accessible pavers in the cobblestone street, as well as an expanded sidewalk to create an improved intersection layout and shorter, more direct crossings. In addition to these safety enhancements, our plaza program has turned underused roadbeds into vibrant and accessible pedestrian spaces with 65 locations currently open to the public. Making these upgrades and all of our projects accessible, safe, and successful cannot be done without input and guidance from accessibility experts. DOT works closely with the disability community and advocates to understand issues that people with disabilities face while navigating city streets. We host workshops, run online surveys, and speak directly to experts in the field to vet design ideas and test new treatments, materials, and technologies. To give an example, DOT's mobility management team co-organizes mobility clinics and evaluation events with community partners in which people with disabilities learn new travel skills while DOT tests and surveys participants about potential street treatments. In the face of the many challenges posed by COVID-19, DOT continues to partner with community organizations to engage the public through virtual and teleconference platforms. During the summer, we held an informational outreach session with high school students who are blind or have low vision. Held via Zoom, the virtual session enabled an engaging conversation with students who learned about the physical design approaches DOT applies to enhance travel for people with vision disabilities. And to engage older adults with disabilities, DOT held a conference via phone to learn about the mobility challenges older adults are experiencing due to the pandemic and to share information and to share information about our accessibility work. DOT also produces the Mobility Management Resource Guide, which includes information about street improvement projects, transit services, and other DOT initiatives to enhance mobility and accessibility. And last week, DOT was pleased to welcome Edmund S. Sayadu to backfill our accessibility coordinator position. This critical advisor to the commissioner is the agency's representative for accessibility initiatives and leads ADA policy and compliance internally and externally. Another core part of the agency's mission is to balance many different uses for our streets while maintaining access for all. Particularly on our busy commercial corridors, corridors we manage curb use to facilitate loading and unloading of goods and passengers, access to transit and temporary parking for shoppers and visitors among other uses, while, all while maintaining emergency access. As an important part of this mission, our parking permit unit administers approximately 27,000 parking permits for people with disabilities. These permits provide motorists with a documented disability greater flexibility by allowing parking in metered zones free of charge, as well as use of no parking areas, authorized parking only areas, and truck loading areas. Now I will speak about DOT's work under now I will speak about DOT's work under Mayor de Blasio's leadership to transform our streets in the face of COVID-19 and to promote safe recreation, sustainable transportation, and support the city's beloved restaurant and retail industries. First, as Commissioner Trottenberg recently testified in detail, this administration has implemented over 83 miles of open streets citywide, 
citywide, nearly 50% of which are in zip codes with the highest rates of COVID in the city, mostly communities of color, and nearly 60% of which are in census tracts that are low to moderate income. When it comes to accessibility, DOT, DOT understands that a significant concern for some people with disabilities who rely on a vehicle is, is continued local access for parking and for loading and unloading passengers and taxis for hire vehicles, accessoride, and private cars. This is one of several important reasons that our open street program maintains local access. But we are also keenly aware of the program's operational challenges, including the need to maintain appropriate setups and are mindful of this issue as we plan for the program's future. Building on Open Streets program, DOT in partnership with the Council on Restaurant Industry established the Open Restaurants program. This has been one of our most far reaching and successful COVID related initiatives. And we think, and we think the largest such program in the world. To date, over 10,700 restaurants have applied to participate in the program, supporting an estimated 90,000 jobs for a diverse group of employees. New Yorkers have embraced the program in neighborhoods throughout the city, in Mott Haven in the Bronx, Washington Heights in Manhattan, Jackson Heights in Queens, Sunset Park in Brooklyn, Tompkinsville in Staten Island, and dozens more. And now, <clears throat> And now through the Open Storefronts program, which the mayor announced on October 28th, retail establishments can use sidewalk space in front of their business as well, provided that they maintain a clear path of travel for pedestrians. In the face of COVID-19, we deployed and expanded the open restaurant program quickly by allowing restaurant self-certification and then relying on an army of city employees to inspect each location and require modifications where we discovered issues. While we understand there were challenges with this approach, we work diligently with business owners to ensure ADA compliance, requiring street setups to either be flush with the curb or provide temporary ramps, and ensuring compliance with path of travel, table height, and clearance requirements. Moped has created helpful fact sheets on the accessibility requirements for both open restaurants and open storefronts, including detailed diagrams and instructions, which are, which are available on their website. As the mayor announced and the council codified in local law 114 of 2020, sponsored by council member Reynoso, work is underway to design and <clears throat> to design the legal and operational structure for a permanent open restaurants program with the goal of having it in place before the end of next year. Now, as we turn to making the popular program, which was created under an emergency mayoral executive order, to a permanent part of our city, we look forward to discussing with the council the longer term operational, fiscal and legal issues to be resolved. And it will be important to ensure that setups and guidelines under the permanent program meet ADA standards while maintaining appropriate clear paths for all pedestrians. Finally, in developing a permanent program, we must remember that DOT's core mission remains moving people and goods through the city safely, efficiently and in an environmentally sustainable manner in an environmentally sustainable manner that is accessible to all. Therefore, the future program must also prioritize bike lanes, bus lanes, pedestrian space, loading, unloading, as well as parking for people with disabilities, among other competing uses, while leaving room for future innovation. In conclusion, as use of the city streets continues to evolve, DOT is committed to creating a more accessible city for all. In the midst of these challenging times, we thank the council for your ongoing partnership and look forward to continuing this critical work. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we now welcome any questions. Thank you. I, I have a few questions and, and they, I know that my colleagues also they have the question. Uh, since we, during after the pandemic, you know, be, we've been able to work with a with a, a open street restaurant program. Is something that we share the concept, but also I will assume that you guys working every day thinking about challenges uh, that come with a program. We should continue with those program, but we need to address things that are related to improvement. Uh, how does DOT work with the business to ensure that sidewalking streets around those establishments uh, are participating on their remain, sorry, participating are uh, uh, remain accessible 
to pedestrian, especially for people living with physical challenges. So our inspectors, uh, they go out and while they are inspecting the businesses and the restaurants, uh, they talk with the managers and owners and we provide them with advice on how to make sure that their facility as well as the rest of the sidewalk is accessible. Uh, we answer all their questions and we do our best to provide them with guidelines so that they can adhere to those requirements. Do you see any challenges in the near future uh, that can be, where we can get some pushback from uh, some business owner when it comes to a uh, responsibility that they had to make those area, seating area accessible? Or do you see a level, can you describe a, a general level of cooperation uh, from, from our local business community, especially the restaurant owners? Yeah, I, we, we do have a, a general understanding of uh, compliance. Uh, when we go out, it, it, you know, we, we, have, we have not had a lot of resistance and people have been very uh, eager to have guidance from us when we've gone out and they wanted to get it right. Uh, and even if, you know, they call us and ask us to come back a second or third time, uh, we've been able to do that. So the, the important part is that uh, they reach out to us and we do get the impression that they want to adhere to the guidelines. They want to be doing all the right things and they work toward doing that. Thanks. And what, how can you describe our streets right now when it comes to areas uh, where we have intersections where we have not been able to put some pedestrian island, all the device that, you know, make force the drivers to uh, slow down but instead we still have many intersections where drivers are turning in more than 20 or 25 miles per hour. Have, have you been, do you have a team of people? Are you doing assessment or challenges that we have in some intersections where it's still drivers, they are turning in, in high speed limit? So um, we continue to roll out the, um, our left turn traffic calming program throughout the city. We do um, many intersections a year. We tackle uh, that ha where we've seen specifically um, um, crashes related to turning vehicles. So we continue to target those intersections with uh, calming um, uh, engineering and uh, even within the past year, as we uh, announced in our green wave plan, we've um, modified some of our designs for bike lane intersection to also ensure that vehicles are uh, turning slowly. We we'll continue to roll out that program over the um, coming years. We do, as you know, see the turning vehicles in the intersection as critical to address um, Vision Zero, and we um, continue to do that. When you look at uh, other cities in our country, uh, and I'm not just looking at, I'm not comparing with other places in Europe, but yes, here in our country, which other city do you feel that can you compare that they are doing this better thing than what we're doing here? Or in which area do you think that the city, our city of New York, can say we are a role model? And where do you still see area that we have to improve to be the city with the best, the most friendly one for individuals with physical challenges? Um, thank you for that question. I, I know um, here in New York, we are um, at the forefront of a lot of different initiatives um, from um, one of the largest open streets programs from the installation of uh, large numbers of protected bike lanes 
um, the work we do with our technology and signal infrastructure for um, uh, accessibility, the accessibility or the disability community. Um, so we're always looking at other cities and ways that we can improve on um, how we operate, but we do feel that we, um, we have a, sort of a head start and we're doing a lot of great work when it comes to uh, changing the city and turning it into a place for all street users. Great. Do, do you feel comfortable to say that after we pass a law that mandate DOT to use a the Vision Zero redesign designing program so that we follow all the design are aligned with our goal of Vision Zero, that we are making progress in that area or you feel that because of the COVID-19, there have been some, a, you know, a slowdown on, on, on a, that law that we work together, you know, so be sure that any work to be done or any intersection with this an intersection will be follow our vision zero goal. Um, so just to clarify, are you speaking of the checklist? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, even though we did have a slow start to this, um, our project season because of um, uh, challenges around COVID-19, um, in the summer, we were able to pick back up on our um, implementation of projects throughout the city. Um, we uh, we ensure we always try to ensure that all of our uh, projects ha have the most and best uh, number of elements um, to provide safety for the all street users. We have been updating the checklists online um, as per the law, um, where you can refer back to each project to see how we did. Um, Every checklist, every project that uh, requires a checklist will have that checklist uh, listed along with the project and you can, um, anyone can reference to see uh, how we're doing with including all of the safety elements in our projects. Okay, and my last question in this round, and then we're gonna be calling our colleague who also has question, <laughs> is about our sidewalks. And and as you know, we've been having conversation. I have a bill that we drafting and that I hope also to work together with you guys that will make DOT the leading agency to address anything related to sidewalk. And, and, and our goal is something similar to what's happening in Vision Zero. Like right now, everyone know that if we had to coordinate anything on Vision Zero is our DOT, as, the, so as in this case, Commissioner Politromber, as the leading one, uh, coordinated with the NYPD, uh, with TLC, and, and, or any agency that play any role related to Vision Zero. When it comes to sidewalk, uh, there's some red tapes that we have in the middle, because a lot involve consumer affair. If there's a small business that get involved, a lot of other things, is really involved the department of building. So my experience in this year is not the lack of, of goodwill from you guys and other, but it's about we as a city has not established which is the leading agency that should work, coordinate with the other one. And I'm not gonna be continue repeating. I have many sample of cases, San Nicolas Avenue, 180 and other places here that you know, there's a limited space of, for pedestrians to walk, but it's not that the DOT would not like to, you know, be sure that it, it, we address the problem there, but it's about a lot of things involved, the department of building, other things involved, consuming affair. How do you feel for DOT to be the agency that should be leading the coordination of anything related to make sidewalk accessible to everyone, especially to individuals with physical challenges. So I, I know that we, um, I hear what you're saying with the variety of different agencies that are in, uh, involved in issues related to the sidewalk. So we're definitely interested in hearing more um, on this uh, bill and um, have those conversations going forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now let's move to the colleagues that they have questions. Elio, I'm going to put it back to you. 
So all the team who is controlling the order of the Cali who is uh, have raised a hand to ask questions. Thank you, Chair. We will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know when your time is up. Uh, we'll start first with Council Member Rose, who will be followed by Council Member Cohen. Uh, Council Member Rose. Time starts now. Uh, you Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, um, Deputy Commissioner, the Safe Streets um, for Seniors program is a pedestrian safety initiative for older New Yorkers in which DOT evaluates pedestrian conditions in targeted senior pedestrian focus areas and it makes safety improvements. Could you tell me how many senior pedestrian focus areas are on Staten Island and where they are located um, and what criteria was used to evaluate pedestrian safety and accessibility and what specific mitigation measures have been implemented as a result of this program? Thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm actually going to uh, pass that on to Sean. He has uh, more information on that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member, for the question. And I don't have the exact number of uh, locations, senior pedestrian focus areas on Staten Island. I um, can absolutely get that uh, back to you. Um, I know these areas have been determined um, and they are in all five boroughs. They have been determined uh, by looking at our uh, senior um, uh, safety, injury, and fatality data, um, as well as senior uh, population to focus our attention and efforts on street safety projects um, in those areas. The uh, typical project, I'm just looking to see if I have the answer here. Okay. Um, the typical uh, projects are uh, range from changing signal timing to allow for a longer crossing time uh, for uh, seniors who may have a, a uh, may require a little bit longer to cross the street. Um, and then a lot of the other things that you've seen uh, DOT do across the city, pedestrian refuge islands, so uh, seniors can, um, people who need a longer time, they can wait in the middle of the street while they're crossing, shorten crossings, more direct crossings. Um, so a lot of work with our, our signal timing and uh, geometry changes to uh, aid those seniors who are walking and getting around their neighborhoods. Are these measures also um, targeted where, um, where senior centers are? Um, I understand that there are some neighborhoods that are targeted, but um, like there are uh, clearly identified senior centers where these measures should be applied. Is that also um, a part of the criteria in determining where, they, where these districts are, these areas are? Yeah, and so just to go back to your earlier question, we have two areas within um, Staten Island, the New Door Pylon Boulevard area and, and South Beach. Um, you can find the maps of what is included in those areas on our uh, website under pedestrians and safe streets for seniors. Um, I do know that population is a uh, senior population is a factor in determining these areas, which um, would also indicate that there were senior centers within those zones. I don't know if we're looking specifically at senior um, centers when determining where the zones are. What, what type of volume would trigger uh, a location being considered, uh, uh, you know, a, a applicable for this initiative? That, again, I also don't have the exact answer for that, but that's something that we can look into and I can get you all the re um, requirements for uh, how neighborhoods are chosen for the program. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. 
Uh, thank you, Councilmember Rose. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Cohen, uh, who will be followed by Councilmember Holden. Councilmember Cohen. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, really, I think I have the sort of same question I had when Commissioner Trottenberg testified last time, who I you know, wish her all the success in the world. Um, I'm not sure that, that we're articulating, you know, a sort of macro vision for what the streets are going to look like and, or, and, and that we're using them in a way that makes the most sense for the most New Yorkers. Um, and it, even the fact that you know we're responding to the COVID crisis like at this stage of the game to be so reactionary really I, I think it's disappointing I think that uh, the allocation of you know of valuable street resources I'm just not sure that we're really articulating a vision uh, for, for these resources in a way that's that works for us now and it's certainly that's going to work for us in the future um, you know and we're introducing more and more users to the street you know electric scooters and all these various electric individual mobility devices, like things are changing rapidly. And I feel like, you know, the streets are, you know, that we don't have, we have a finite number of streets, but how we use them, I, I just, again, I'm not con convinced that we're articulating a, a vision for, for how this is, you know, it's sustainable, you know, having all of these, uh, the vast amount of street, street that's devoted to residential parking I've talked to the commissioner about uh, residential parking permits and there seems to be a low level of enthusiasm for that. But I mean, that's a lot of space that's allocated to parking cars, many of which may not even be registered to people who live in the city. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the agency's just you know, long-term vision and, and how you think that we could better allocate uh, you know, limited street resources? So I think there's a couple of different um, uh, answers to that question, uh, namely as it comes to our open streets and open restaurants programs and our open street restaurant programs, um, we did learn a lot of uh, how to um, design the city streets. I think we were able to, uh, by launching those programs, help uh, other people in the city re-envision how New York City streets can be used. Um, we definitely learned a lot of lessons with that program. Um, but the program's also built off of um, a lot of work that the agency already did. So we're gonna take the work that we've been doing, the work that we did over the summer and fall, um, the lessons that we've learned and um, develop longer term future programs develop, um, out of this and take all the lessons that we learned, especially when it comes to um, how we can make sure the streets accommodate people with disabilities. Uh, into account as we develop those programs. I think there has been um, some visions laid out in our Green Wave uh, plan, as well as the Better Buses plan, uh, to show uh, how and where we intend on transforming some of those streets. And now we hope to layer in these um, pedestrian elements and these uh, pedestrian streets into those uh, planning uh, processes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we will hear from Councilmember Holden, who will be followed by Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Holden. Yes. Uh, oh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone. And thank you, Chair, for this hearing. I think it's very important to talk about just basic needs of some communities that are not getting the improvements that we heard today. Uh, for instance, I have three years waited for speed bumps on 76th Street in Woodhaven. Uh, I've also had um, a crosswalk, many crosswalks in my community that are really, you're, anyone walking would take uh, their lives in their hands because of, for instance, Jamaica Avenue and Woodhaven Boulevard, which is not really my district. It's a little out of my district but it's like walking on the moon. And I've, I've, I've approached DOT many times about fixing that, not, not touched. Um, we even see heavily traveled streets, not only in my district, but throughout the city that are rippled. You have this ripple on the roadbed. 
that it's not fixed. Walking, normal walking, people with disabilities can't walk on those kind of ripples. And that's not fixed. And then we see parking around precincts where police vehicles, their own personal vehicles parked on the sidewalk, blocking crosswalks, doing everything, parking everywhere. And how can we even fix that? How can we prevent them from doing that other than just enforcement? Can we do improvements on these corners, especially around precincts that will stop them from parking, stop the police and they're not going to enforce their own um, laws. Obviously, we're not we're not seeing the enforcement around precincts, especially some of mine, where the the police vehicles are parked everywhere, blocking crosswalks. So forget about you know. I think we have to get back to sometimes the basics of clearing our crosswalks, prevent people from parking on the sidewalks. But I'd, I'd like to address the these things. And I'm not getting from Queens DOT, I'm not getting the answers. I'm getting a very, very slow response. And I don't want to hear the COVID. This predates the COVID. You know, I'm hearing that. I heard at this hearing that the COVID slowed things up. Yeah, we understand that. But we weren't getting service before the COVID. Because now it's three years. So I just like the DOT officials here to try to address some of these. What is the procedure on damaged crosswalks? I'm talking about the roadbed. The ripple that I mentioned, the what what is the procedure on that? Is that does that get the, like a uh, sort of put on the back burner here? Are you speaking? I think oh. the hi, council member. Thanks for all your. I'm not sure if you're done. I can wait till you're done. No, no, I'm. I'm I have more, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I'm I'm, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. So Rebecca, I was going to jump in on the roadbed issue. Sure. So you know, uh, as you know. Uh, the mayor and the commissioner uh, have increased our ability to resurface our roadways tremendously. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've been having uh, 1,300 and 1,100 uh, miles resurfaced over the years. And in deciding where we go to resurface and to fixing those problems that you talked about, uh, we do go to the community, we do go to elected officials, and we do use that to set our schedule in every community board. So uh, in some yeah, cases, uh, it's a full... Go, oh, one second, can I just, because I'm on, a, on the clock here. Uh, on, on that kind of thing, I ask for just the milling, and they don't really do this, or if, if I can have the, the crosswalk milled. Uh, because I wait for years then to have the whole street milled, let's say the whole block. And I only need the crosswalk really, because it's dangerous. And I'm not, do you have a program that when you see dangerous cro crosswalks, because it, you can't maneuver them, you can't walk over them even, much less a, a person with disabilities or the ripples that it, we're not, we're not seeing that. Do you have that program? I mean, maybe Rebecca Zach can answer that. Do you have that? I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm we not, not we, we, have a, we, have a, we have a, we have a maintenance program that addresses a number of different conditions on the roadway. Uh, specifically, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. And, and usually they're at roadways by bus stops. Yeah. Uh, we do take those requests. And in the off season, we have had our, our maintenance crews go out and address those bus, bus locations that have those ripple effects that you talk about. So we do do it. And I guess, I guess we just need to make sure we get the locations that you're talking about and we will do our best to try to address those. Thank you. I just have one other question if I may chair. Uh, I just had a pedestrian, a senior that was killed um, crossing the street. And this was a, a, an hour that um, just before dawn, where it's hard to see, I understand that, uh, where they're still investigating it. Could you tell me DOT's role in an investigation? Do you guys work hand in hand with the police uh, and, and talk about what improvements could be made or what happened in that particular case where a pedestrian was killed or struck um, by a motor vehicle? Do you, do you work with, with the NYPD after that happens? The NYPD is the primary investigator of the um, incident and however we do send a team, a street team out to these locations to assess the safety elements at the 
location to see if there's anything we can do immediately uh, to improve the condition or over time. So um, we'll make an initial set of recommendations. The street team will make an initial set of recommendations um, for anything they find immediately. And then those that location, if it is found to need more work, will um, go into our street improvement program um, list and will be informed by some of the information that NYPD eventually determines to be a uh, part of the crash. Greg, I, I would like to be involved in that, to at least get the result of the investigations of your working with NYPD. And I'd like, you know, what DOT has in mind, because um, I'm a little, you know, I'm very concerned about um, right now people, like the, the Commissioner Trottenberg said in the previous hearing, um, during the COVID, we're seeing many more people speeding. I'm not saying the speeding was a result of this current accident that I had in my district, but I'm concerned about throughout the city that we see people speeding. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure we're getting the enforcement either, but I think we need to, to, to talk about this as to what we can do. I'm having a difficult time getting speeding addressed in my district throughout the area. And I think most people are concerned about this. So we, we need, you know, we need to come up with solutions. But anyway, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, next, we will hear from Council Member Miller. Council Member Miller. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Good, uh, good afternoon, Chair. It is good to see you and, and my colleagues. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I, I, I really don't. Uh, I, and, and I will begin as I begun for the last seven years when we have had hearings uh, which involved the agency, the DOT, and, and that is um, whether or not the lack of diversity is a manifestation of the, the lack of equity in services and how they get delivered throughout communities throughout the city of New York. I can agree, agree wholeheartedly, concur wholeheartedly with my uh, colleague Holder that these are things that predate um, COVID. But I would also submit that what we have seen uh, and, and we have put forth viable plans, whether it was busways, um, uh, uh, programs and projects to, to combat the illegal, un unaccessible and unsafe commuter vans um, and many more. Uh, and, and nothing has been done over the past seven years. What happens uh, when we talk about Vision Zero here in Southeast Queens and other communities of color throughout the city, we don't get the investment and in capital improvement, which includes uh, uh, mediums and other capital investment to keep people safe. We get punitive uh, uh, speed cameras and red light cameras which is fine, but we want more. We also want to be engaged as a community. Uh, glad to see you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Haywood. Uh, that's a face I have not seen for the past seven years. I'm very interested to hear about uh, sidewalks and, and plans. Uh, obviously, homeowners are deeply impacted. But I want to talk about accessibility and how that's important. So we have a DOT project that is occurring right now here on Merrick Boulevard uh, in, in, in Southeast Queens. It is not a project that was engaged, that the community was engaged in any public discourse or any other form of engagement. They were at the community board meeting last week and, and, and they were made well aware that they were being disingenuous at best in saying that. We went to them and we asked them to be able to mitigate a problem that would the community here knew about forever. You, you, during uh, rush hour and certain times of the day, it will take you 20 minutes to go three blocks. And there was a study, a study of which that was uh, done by DOT, uh, proposed by the Jamaica Now, uh, which was finished sometime in April or May, has yet to be released. I think that it's going to demonstrate what we already know, that there are areas of congestion uh, that we have put forth some solutions and nothing has happened. So I, I look forward to seeing that report uh, sooner than later. 
um, my office went to DOT with this problem uh, of congestion and asked for a, a meeting to discuss how do we mitigate it. Uh, part of that was a suggestion of a no standing, depending on the, obviously the time of day, the traffic flow, everyone goes to the subway in the morning, everyone comes back in the afternoon. The buses will take 20 minutes to go three miles and then 20 minutes to go three blocks. Everyone knows what this is. DOT came out, met with my office, the precinct, and made an announcement that they had already begun uh, on a bus lane that we were supposed to be touring to discuss. They also painted a bus lane everywhere along this two mile corridor, except for the locations where the problem began. I have some pictures here where the side from 107 and Merrick, 108 and Merrick and then other places, the common allergy amongst these hot spots, uh, they are body shops. And on these body shops, on this main thoroughway, they park in the bus stop, they park on the street. We have at least over 100 cars that are parked on the street that never move, belonging to these body shops. We have, at this location, we have three senior buildings and they cannot walk on the sidewalk because they have cars parked on the sidewalk. Now, DOT was out there with us. The 103rd Precinct was out there with us. And we've been having this conversation for more than a year. None of it's been mitigated. Now, DOT has moved forward with a plan to put a bus lane, not on the curb, but taking away one of the driving lanes. Now we're down to one lane. And now when these cars double park and these things happen at, at, at these same locations, um, we're, we're worse off than we were to begin with. That was no community engagement, but it was indicative of DOT what they do. They decide that they want to implement a certain program and they're gonna fit a square peg into a round hole. And that's just not working. There has been no engagement and it is just consistent with what you're doing. Now, this is the latest project, um, the busway that we were greatly anticipating on Archer Avenue, what we've been working with for nearly 10, two decades, uh, when there was uh, administrator allocated money, DOT decided they wanted to do Jamaica Avenue instead. And when there was community pushback and merchants pushback, and there were no allies who, to go along with that, that project just went away even though Archer Avenue is the busiest bus corridor in America. Nearly a quarter of a million people take the trains and buses at those locations daily, and we can't get anything to address that. So how do we move forward here? How do we move forward with, you talk about, the, we're talking engaging elected and engaging communities I would, I, again, I would submit that that is disingenuous at best. It has not happened. The programs that has happened is what DOT has felt necessary on their own. But at the end of the day, we still have a busy, congested commercial and bus corridor of Jamaica Avenue, Archer Avenue. That is, it is, we still have illegal and unaccessible uh, commuter vans that block buses and all traffic on Archer Avenue. These are problems that we've been dealing with for the last six years. We've written legislation, no enforcement. Uh, we were supposed to do hearings. We didn't do the hearing out there. Uh, Commissioner Trottenberg came out there three or four times. In fact, nearly got ran over by a commuter van on the, on the, who jumped the curb. Nothing has happened. Um, so this all sounds good. But the practical application of it and the impact on mitigating uh, congestion and, and creating accessibility. When I have seniors who cannot walk out of their building, nearly 300 seniors, and for two blocks, cars are parked on the sidewalk. Derelict cars are parked on the street. And there's no accessibility. Now, the plan was put a bus lane there on the curb to move those cars 
to get him off the curb. Instead, what do we do? And then the kicker of all kickers is DOT announces last week that we put down the bike bus lane. They also said that they were going to talk with us about times. And now their signs are going up suggesting cameras, fines, but no times. And so now it's this 24 seven bus lane, which makes absolutely no sense. So they did not talk to with us about that. But going back to the problem, which we initiated with them, which was these seven or eight body shops that exist and block the streets and block the sidewalks. Everywhere along these two mile stretch has a bus lane except for in front of the body shop because they want to they want to have a conversation with the owners to figure out how to help them move along. So the rest of the world is being inconvenienced with this bus lane, but the people who caused the problem, the necessitated the need for a bus lane, they don't have it. In fact, I was told last week that they're no longer painting lines and that they're going to paint lines in front of the body shops in the spring. So for the next six, six months, we're going to continue to be inconvenienced as a community on this main thoroughfare. And the people who have created this problem continue to operate just as business as usual. I hope that I, I, listen, and 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 I and I heard all the the, the praise that was being heaped. Uh, you know, I I just don't share those sentiments uh, in theory, but in practical application, it never happened in this community. And 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 as I drive throughout the city, there are communities of color that don't get the same investment, and there is absolutely no enforcement. I remember talking four years ago about Atlantic Avenue. There is a no standing that runs from the Brooklyn Bridge to Queens and is busy and it's occupied all the time. That trip will take you an hour and a half leaving City Hall and, and, and nobody does anything about it. So we're doing all these studies. I don't know what we're studying, but the people that's on the ground, the people that need to access these streets and sidewalks, are not being impacted. And they're particularly not being impacted in the outer borough. They're particularly not being impacted in the communities of color. And we are not seeing the investment that we're seeing in other places in the city. We want to be safe. If, 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 if Vision Zero is applicable, we want to be safe, but we want something other than speed cameras to keep us safe. We, want, we don't want punitive dollar investments or, uh, to, that's going to keep us safe. Um, we, we're now seeing speed cameras in the middle of, of side blocks on residential streets in Southeast Queens here and there. No engagement on that. That is pretty ridiculous. Uh, so I, I think DOT needs to be a lot more transparent in their actions. And, and I know we're a little late in the game. We need to be a lot more diverse so, and, and, and so that we have ideas that really reflect the needs and the values of these communities that we are serving. Councilmember, I think that you brought a lot of specific things that is very important to follow up. It, it, why, why don't we take this approach? I know that in the past you have brought to attention the need to walk there through that area. It, it, beside what DOT can say, what I can say is that let's follow up and let's see how we can, you know, uh, put some effort together uh, and do the walk so we don't give up. But just bring DOT, put the team together so that we can do a walk in that area so that we can look at a specific thing that we should do I, to address I, the need of your community. I appreciate that, but it, it has to be at the senior level because uh, over the last month, they meet every Wednesday with my office and, and nothing has happened. And again, they went to the community board. The community is totally upset. They, they have this two miles that they of of a busiest thoroughfare in the community that they can't use. And the problem people, you know, why would you put a bus lane and omit the people that caused the problem? Like okay. what's the justification Let's, for that? 
Then I really answers. We, we need answers. And the answers I'm not getting at the local level. So I'm talking to the deputy commissioners now to see who, who's accountable for, you know, okay. what, what was the plan? So I, I agree with you. First of all, like my, what I put in the table is that, and we were here not from DOT. So, uh, but before we hear from them, what, I can, what they can say, uh, let's see how we, you and I can follow on any way that we can be helpful to you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone from DOT would like to address? Um, I can just, I will say one uh, thing. I'm not, not specific to the Merrick Boulevard um, bus lane. I know you've been working with our Queens office uh, on those conversations. And I think um, Chair Rodriguez has um, some advice on how we can move forward on that. Generally, um, just uh, as our commissioner testified at the preliminary budget hearing, um, a little while ago, we have, um, in relation to our projects, our citywide safety projects, um, we analyzed the number of those projects implemented um, in New York City's highest poverty and highest non-white neighborhoods um, based on census tract demographics. And we found that these neighborhoods not only received a proportional share of projects, but also, some, uh, also realized some of the largest drops in pedestrian fatalities. Um, so while we certainly do have more work to do in terms of reaching uh, all corners of the city, um, our data-driven approach so far has uh, taken us to the uh, neighborhoods all over the city, um, and we're really working to address bringing down our fatalities and injuries um, uh, everywhere uh, we possibly can. Do you want to share that data? Can you share that data? Yeah, I believe it's in our, um, yep, sure. I'd like to see it. I, I would suspect okay. they're probably in poor gentrified com communities that, that, that are getting these investments. I, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them in Southeast Queens. I have not seen them at all. I, I, I'd love to see it. Okay. Okay. Okay, it's, uh, share the data and then we will follow with their plan, okay? And, and I take in as a, you know, something that you got from the OT came, we can work together to Organize a, a walk with some member of your team and the committee and, and the and the a council member Miller and myself will be there too, so Thank that we you. can a walk together and see what are the challenges. Are we not doing the the, the busway plan? Is that not happening? I see somebody waving their hand. That was the big announcement by the administration. Are we not doing the busway? Can you un? Oh, there you go. So, hi, council member. In regards to Merrick, I know there was five blocks that you had concerns about. So that part has not been done, and you wanted further community engagement on that, which we have committed to. You also wanted uh, Archer um, to be a busway, and we. What, what does that mean? I'm sorry. Uh, what, what does that mean? That 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 I wanted further community engagement. And we committed to that because I've been told that that won't be addressed until this spring, which means that we're going to continue to have that problem till next spring. You know, I, I think one of the challenges that we have right now is, you know, the season ran out, the project started when they started. And that's my understanding is that you had very specific concerns for those areas. And I, my understanding is that you wanted that held for now so we could have more community engagement, which I believe is to start no, in the winter. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's misinformation. That is the problem area. We went to them and asked them to put a no stand in and they came up with the bus lane, but that is certainly misinformation. That was like, no, absolutely not. Those people caused the problem. Those people are the reason why 300 season, seniors cannot even walk on the sidewalk out of the building because they're parking on the street. They're the reason why they can't cross the street to even get a bus because they're parked in the lane and in the street. Like we want that done now. We don't want it done in the spring. Miscommunication. Okay, let's follow up, Council Member, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. The bus lane? The, the are you talking about Archer or Merrick? Archer. Archer is you. Um, I'm sorry, one second. You wanted to put um, for 
we're currently trying to put together a project and to and we will be following up with you for potential next spring. And that, that is that is the same as it was. I know that's your desire there, and, and we we're completely clear with that, and we are working on what that would look like. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd love for you to be okay. a part of this conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any other Council Members with questions for DOT? Chair, do you have any uh, other questions for DOT? Yeah. To, uh, if, uh, my question on which other city are doing things related to uh, address challenges important to individual physical challenges that we can look at it right now. Do you are, are you looking at any other? And again, I'm proud of the work that we have been able to do together uh, with DOT, with the speaker, with the colleague, and and the fact that we hear from other from my colleague. Uh, specific thing that has to be addressed on attention to be given at the same level in underserved communities and in the whole city of New York is something that, you know, we've been addressing. And I hope again that uh, uh, the fact that we have area to still deal with and challenges, it doesn't take credit for a lot of accomplishment that we have been able to do together. So with that spirit, is there anything that you have seen in other cities that as we have been to be proud of being a role model that you can say other places in LA or other city, they are doing things that we should look at it to improve accessibility to our New Yorkers and visitors with physical challenges. So we have um, spoken um, to both LA and Philly about um, uh, things that they are doing there in regards to ped ramps. I think, um, I think another piece that I, as I mentioned in our testimony, is that we have our new accessibility coordinator um, who started last week at DOT, and um, I feel that this is something that uh, he'll be able to tackle uh, beyond what we've already been doing and have those conversations not only uh, internally with the city but um, externally with other. Um, cities as well. I think uh, his role here will be, you know, greatly appreciated along with the work that we've already been doing with our mobility management team, which I also mentioned in uh, the testimony. So we have new people and people who have been in the agency for a while thinking about this question and having those conversations with other cities. And I think in our conversations with LA and Philly, so, har so far we've found and other cities we found that our program is uh, the most aggressive. We're way ahead um, of these cities and we wanna, we wanna keep that up and hope that the new accessibility coordinator and the work that we're doing will help us um, keep this pace. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other, oh, I, Chair Rodriguez, I think Councilmember Holden would like to ask another question if that's okay with you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one other, one quick question. Um, I've in a number of locations throughout my district, I've asked for raised crosswalks uh, to be implemented or to be installed as a tool. I'm not seeing. But I think they act um, especially by a school. I have a, a very hazardous um, wide street with a curve, and you really can't see the crosswalk. Uh, when tr when cars and trucks are coming around the curb. So I asked for a raised crosswalk, which would act also as a speed bump. And I've seen that implemented very well in Puerto Rico and, and many European countries. I'm not seeing it in New York City. We have have you installed any raised we crosswalks? Do. You do? We do. And let me, I can get the location. Right, for you. It's, it's pretty limiting in terms of because of the corners and drainage and making sure that we can still have water and things drain at the corners. It's challenging, um, but we do have them. We don't have many because of that, but um, because I can find, out where, they, I can find out where they little, are. Because of drainage, you could put a little pipe at the curb that would get the water through. I mean, there's no way to yeah. engineer that? 
I don't know if we would, I'm not sure about our ability to install pipes at the curb or what that would mean for sanitation or, or, or whatever, but I'm just saying, yes, we do have them. Um, and I, I'm not sure what the, what the challenges or if you ever got a response the, about the specific location that you're asking about. If you were denied, uh, we can talk about it, but if you never got a response, we can, we can go from there. Most of the time I'm denied, except when somebody requests um, a traffic light. They seem to have a lot of money for traffic lights uh, which I don't believe many work on residential streets because people speed up at the yellow. Um, I would like traffic calming and I, I'm not getting speed bumps, but I think this city does not implement crosswalks, raised crosswalks enough. I'm seeing that in European countries. I'm seeing it all over the United yeah. States even. And we are slow to do that. And drainage, come on, other cities have figured it out. Um, I think what we have to do is think outside the box, but also implement raised crosswalks that are more visible in certain locations. Sometimes they're made out of brick. I've seen it in Puerto Rico, out of brick, beautiful crossing. And um, it doesn't have to be on a corner, all right? It could be mid-block as long as there's there could some traffic signal or not, or not. But we need to start making our, our corners or our, our, our crossings safer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and again, I feel that, you know, as you are listening from all colleagues here, it, the message is to DOT to you guys that, you know, the 51 council members should be the immediate ear that you should, should rely on when it comes to, you know, things that we have to add to our communities. And, 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 and again, as, uh, I can say that we're doing a good job. I feel like we can do much better. And if we are able to follow with a specific thing that we have in different parts of the community. And of course, I have many local things from the plaza, from other items where I have particular hidden running intersection that is happening because, you know, the drivers are turning in a, a driving a very fast when they make a turn. I will follow you guys, but a, uh, let's be sure that we continue uh, listening to a uh, suggestion and, uh, on how we can improve in each council member. So with that, thank you to the panel, and then we move to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Uh, each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin as soon as they have set the timer. Uh, please wait until the sergeant announces that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Um, I would like to first welcome uh, Iman Rem, uh, Remwawi to uh, testify. And I apologize for uh, uh, the pronunciation of your name. That's totally fine. Thank you so much. Um, hi, my name oh. is Iman Remwawi. Oh, sorry. You may begin. Okay, great. Um, my name is Iman Remwawi. Thank you so much for including me. Um, I work for New York Lawyers for the Public Interest and in the Disability Justice Program. I am also a double amputee with lupus and I use a walker. Uh, for almost four years, I have worked at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest as the accessoride coordinator and organizer to help people with disabilities who use New York City's paratransit service to obtain, um, to obtain better service. Through this work and from my own personal experience, I have realized that paratransit isn't the only access issue for people with disabilities in the city. Accessible streets play an essential role in the lives of all New Yorkers in many ways, going from the grocery store to using a taxi or even getting to your jobs. And yet there is so much inaccessibility in our city. How can New York City be the best city in the world and exclude one of the most disenfranchised communities out there? I can't hide who I am and I won't. If people don't wanna associate with me, I'm not interested in associated with them. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work, especially when we are talking about access and the need to request accommodations from the city. 
Property owners are expected to clear snow and ice off the sidewalks to create a four foot wide path for pedestrians, including pedestrian walkways, curb cuts. Property owners and businesses must also keep sidewalks clean as well as clear of objects that obstruct passage. Failure to comply with local laws governing snow and obstruction removal can lead to fines. Prompt snow and obstruction removal is especially critical for seniors and individuals with mobility impairments like me. But fortunately, I have seen sidewalks obstructed by trash and snow more times than I can count in all five boroughs, including in the very busy areas like Grand Concourse in the Bronx or in downtown Brooklyn. I've had to climb over such barriers, which isn't easy for someone like me, or hope that a stranger could help me over. I've had to go into the street when I couldn't get past. And when I used a wheelchair, sometimes I'd have to go all the way back to the other side of the block just to cross at the corner. Um, no one should have to do that. It is unacceptable. And how is that fair to me? Am I not an equal citizen under law? Why does that seem like the city, uh, why does it seem like the city puts the responsibility of watching out for those reporting and potentially arguing these property owners on everyday citizens rather than the officials and agencies who are paid to do it? Additionally, fallen trees or branches are a huge problem, especially in Queens. You can report trees and branches that have fallen on public property, but oftentimes it takes a while to get it removed. Pedestrian ramps and curb cuts are not up to par in any borough. I've gotten, it's gotten better but it's not as what it should be. It's as if no one has asked a person with a physical disability if these pedestrian ramps actually work. A few ramps that I absolutely loathed are attached to public libraries. One is from the main library at 42nd and 6th and the other is at Prospect Park. I have not been to them in years because I am afraid that I will fly off and go into the street. I know I'm not the only one because I've had the talks with several people who have mobility issues and they have the same complaints. Relatively new concerns since the start of COVID are accessibility issues with outdoor dining. I have seen a number of outdoor dining setups that block entire sidewalks in Manhattan and I've had to go into the street to avoid them. I'm able to do that because I use a walker and my balance is improving but people who use wheelchairs have to go, have the worst time to get around those blockages. I've had other people tell me that they have to simply go back around the block and go at the corner because they can't get through. And that's exhausting. We really need to think about the negative it's, impact. It's our, yeah, summarize and if sorry, you take- I'm almost, for, if yeah, I'm almost take, done. You can, you can send a testimony uh, by if you don't mind, please summarize. That's, that's fine, I'm almost done. Um, we really need to think about the negative impact blocking sidewalks has on the disability community, but we aren't the only ones. What about people with strollers, luggage, or packages? The same ways that elevators work for everyone, so do accessible sidewalks. Again, thank you for the, uh, sharing my testimony. It is vitally important for streets and sidewalks to be clear of obstruction, particularly for seniors and persons with disabilities because we often have mobility devices that need the space to get through. Uh, please contact me if you have any other questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing no questions, we'll move on to the next panelist. Uh, next, we will have Kathleen Collins. Kathleen? I'm stopped now. Uh, Good afternoon, my name is Kathleen Collins and I am a quadruple amputee from birth. Uh, I'm also an attorney who is retired from the, uh, I worked for the Port Authority for over 30 years. Um, right now, I'm speaking on behalf of Downstate New York ADAPT, where I am a co-coordinator. And Downstate New York ADAPT is a grassroots, non-hierarchical community of people with all types of disabilities advocating for the civil rights of people with disabilities, including but not limited to the right to live in, the right to live in and fully participate in the larger community. Due to the time lim limitations here, today um, I'm just going to mention the areas that I will be submitting a written, written comments to the, uh, to, to the committee. I just want to highlight uh, the five Right now, we have five areas that we're going to speak about in our uh, proposed comments. We probably will add to that today. Uh, the five areas that we plan to address are curb 
ramps, also known as head ramps, I've heard to you today, uh, the condition of sidewalks and roadways, physical obstacles encountered on the sidewalks and in the roadways, problems with traffic signals, including the fact that so many of the traffic signals are not accessible to our sisters and brothers who are hearing impaired, and finally, enforcement of traffic regulations. We ask that the committee create an advisory board consisting of New Yorkers with many different types of disabilities that could assist this committee and other city council committees in their work. So, do, so we do not continually have to bring lawsuits against the city. Further, finally, we ask that this committee continue to reach out to New Yorkers with disabilities to make New York a truly great and safe city for all New Yorkers and for our wonderful city. So please reach out to us, Downstate New York Adapt at G it's also dnyadapt at gmail.com. Please reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay. Uh, so I, have a question. I just have a quick question. Will we be able to access this recording later? And if so, where? And then also with our comments, do we just send them to that click? that link that we got in the email that says uh, you just click on it and you send it to the transportation committee? Yes, you can submit written testimony through that link and uh, we can follow up with you if you need any assistance with that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And it's 72 okay. hours after this, so it's as of Wednesday would be the deadline. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, 72 hours from the date of from today is the deadline for, commit, for written comments. Yes. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. Okay, uh, next we will hear from Gene Ryan. Time Gene. starts now. Hi, I'm Gene Ryan. I'm president of Disabled in Action of Metropolitan New York. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Uh, we represent people with all kinds of disabilities, and this is our 50th year, five zeros, and we intend to be around for at least 50 more years. Um, I would like to address about five or six things, whatever I have time for, and then I will submit written testimony also. Um, one problem is the accessible street crossings for blind people who live all over. They don't just live on certain streets where you have them now. They should be all over the city. Every, every single uh, light should have safe street crossings for people who are blind. And people become, most people who are blind become blind in later life. So they're not going to have a whole lot of travel skills for being blind. So that's why this is really important to a huge um, number of people in our community all over the city. Curb cuts, we want curb cuts, pedestrian ramps at all corners and in good repair. We don't want ponding. There are some corners that perpetually have ponding so deep that you just cannot go through it safely with a wheelchair. And the only people who can manage those are people with high boots or really good jumping skills. And I would venture to say that most people who are walking in New York City do not have really good jumping skills. Also the crosswalks, uh, somebody mentioned that before, the, the period of time that crosswalks are repaired is a really long time. And it shouldn't be because so many crosswalks are really marked up with, cross, with potholes and just are so bad you mm -hmm. can hardly cross. Oh, okay, let me just quickly cover the other ones. E-scooter regulation. There should be none on sidewalks. Regulated speeds on all e-scooters, rental or not. No parking scooters near an intersection or on a sidewalk. Um, and also we want the, the DOT to eliminate their rule, allowing parking at ped ramps at T, blocking ped ramps at T intersections. This is discriminatory to people with disabilities and it's been in effect since around 2007 or 2008. And it is totally discriminatory to us because we cannot do mid block crossings and we need to. 
And the, uh, the last two things I'll mention in my written testimony, R Shore Road bus stops in Bay Ridge in New York are totally impassable and unable to be used by wheelchair users and snow removals at intersections is a perennial problem and the snow plow just keeps plowing the snow there and leaving it and it becomes to be a big huge ridge of ice that traps wheelchair, wheelchair users in our homes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Yeah, I just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. It, it, thank you. So thank you for your leadership. And, and, and I'm also a, a believe that the leadership that your institution and many other advocates uh, are so important. And that's why uh, even the level of uh, a work that has been done in our city to make our intersection accessible is also the result or advocate group, not only legislation and legislators and also many also other results or lawsuit. So I hope again that working with all the advocates, all the colleagues in government, colleagues in government and, and we can be able again to make New York City a, a role model a, for the whole nation. I think that there's a lot of work that we have done, but there's many other that Thank we you. have to do. And I wonder, where are they going to put the snow with all the outdoor restaurants? Let's, let's, I know. <laughs> well, you know, Minneapolis, Minneapolis, okay. Well, I have an idea. Minneapolis melts the snow. I'm, I'm from Minnesota originally. Minneapolis melts the snow. There's no place to put a whole lot of snow. We could have melters in every neighborhood that you know, melt the snow so it just turns to water and goes down into the sewer. And you don't have to haul it away or shovel it to the curb because there's not going to be space this year. And we take your suggestion and we will follow up with you and, and the, in the sanitation and I promise you in DOT too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions for this panelist? Okay, uh, before I turn it back over to the chair, I just wanted to uh, check and if there was anyone else that we missed as far as public testimony, if you could use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, uh, seeing none, Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Elias, and thank you all the staff in the other transportation committee, also my chief of staff, Elizabeth Conforman, my legislation staff, also, uh, Evelyn Collado and Tomas Garita communication. And, you know, this is, this conversation is so important to hear from DOT, to hear from the advocate. And with this, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.